winning a peace. So out of the pain and fury of war has arisen the beginning of a means of rapid transport to the farm of 1,225,000 parts, and each had to be perfect. And in these lines, you see the evidence of another Ford-made miracle. The Willow Run bomber plant has furnished one of the miracle production stories of this war. It produced 8,685 bombers in a steady stream, relentless, unceasing, on time, as methodical as a great river fed by its tributaries. Tail section side panels were joined together to form the top and side complicated wing wiring system. Also, the tubing clusters you saw being assembled in a nut chargers are exhaust-driven turbines, the rotors of which speed up to what's called the greenhouse by flyers. Work a matter of minutes. And attached to its mounting in the wing. Each engine was fastened in place Proofing and propellers quickly were added in this station-to-station -station progress. Here the 4,200 square feet of bomber skin was cleaned. The woman worker polishes the bombardier's window. There is enough aluminum here to fabricate 55,000 coffee percolators, and it's quite a cleaning job. These ships are the product of experience. Constant changes, some dictated by service conditions, have given to the Army Air Forces bombers that fly farther, faster, and higher, with the result that the final models look far different than their older cousins. At Willow Run had to be thoroughly tested by both ground and flight crews. Engine start. And she taxis out to the runway for her first flight. The big ship gathers speed rapidly, racing down the runway for a full power takeoff. We're airborne and the wheels are retracted into their wing well brains and hands. With all the experience that Ford has gained over the years of mass production, best places in the world, which in times of peace will soar in with passengers of freight or both to establish new speed and peak in the air. But when war came, the Army had a glider all its own, a huge cargo glider, the CG-4A. This was a big ship, built for service, designed to carry troops and supplies and equipment. There was room enough inside to carry countless landings in the thick of battle. And all through the war, they handled themselves like real queens of the air. Where did these modern gliders come from? And all these supplies, on arrival at the Iron Mountain Receiving Department, were checked by covered with thin mahogany plywood or skin, here seen being applied to the nose structure, the ribs to the main spar to form the leading edge of a widget to a thin varnish spray which sealed in natural moisture and tended to prevent the wooden wing section was withdrawn and moved by overhead conveyor to the worker in sections next went to workers who applied adhesive or dope to the wing's trailing edge which the aid of an upright standard which swung these wing sections up to mounting level. With a little jiggling, the connecting bracket was hinged at the top so it could be lifted to permit loading or unloading the cargo. Controls had to be so skillfully designed that their locations and leakage would not confer thorough examination. And it speaks well for Ford's remarkably sound craftsmanship that no glider built at Iron Mountain was ever rejected by these keen eyes. So-called snatch operation, two poles were rigged on the field 20 feet apart. 
and the glider will take off. Each one of these big gliders has a wingspan of 83 feet, and the pilots are flying only a few feet from each other. This is not a job for amateurs, but flying like this did a great deal to carry our men to victory during the Allied invasions. Over the deck, 120 miles an hour behind a tow plane, anywhere up to 20,000.